Hello and welcome everyone. This is the first podcast for day 26. We're going to have three podcasts for this day. Um, the first two are going to cover objective one. So objective one is natural selection is the only mechanism that consistently causes adaptive evolution. And so in the first podcast, we're going to cover everything up to sexual dimorphism. So it's going to be um, the different selections we have, directional, disruptive, and stabilizing. We'll certainly define fitness and adaptive evolution. In the, and in the podcast, talking about how natural selection is the only mechanism that consistently leads to favorable adaptations. And in the second podcast, we'll cover this first, finish our first objective with sexual dimorphism and these other uh, traits here. And then in our third podcast, we will cover chap I mean, objective two. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with objective one. So let's write adaptive evolution down first. Generally, what this means is evolution that results in a better match between an organism and their environment. Adaptive evolution requires three things for it to occur. The first is variation. For instance, and I'm going to draw this uh, diagram or picture here in a little bit when we describe, uh, when we talk more about this, but I think it's a good way to illustrate these three things. You, this may be a petri dish, and we may have many different kinds of bacteria growing in here. They're all the same species, I'm just coloring them differently to illustrate that they have different traits, that they have variation. The next thing is that this variation it has to be heritable, meaning that when this bacteria reproduces or divides, it produces two new ones of the same kind. So this trait, so this trait of being red can be passed on to its progeny. The third thing is there has to be a differential reproductive success. So a differing reproductive success. Meaning under some conditions, one of these variants of the bacteria, again it's all the same species, but one of these variants has some sort of advantage. And so it's going to be able to reproduce more often. For instance, if this particular plate, we added an antibiotic to it. So I'm just going to write AB here. And we added it to this plate. Maybe one of these ones, let's say this blue one here. Let's say it has a antibiotic resistance gene on it. And so when you add this antibody to this plate, it will wipe out many of these other ones. Maybe not all of them, but it's going to wipe out a good number of them. And since this one particular bacterium has an antibiotic resistant gene in it, it's going to have the ability to reproduce more than the others. There's still going to be variation in this group here, but amongst the antibiotic resistance gene, this particular trait will uh, be predominant in this population. We'll come back to this in a moment when we want to explain um, how natural selection is the only reliable way to achieve adaptive evolution. We'll come back to it though. There's a term that your book mentions. It's a very important term when we think about evolution and that's called fitness. I'm going to indicate what it is, and then we're going to talk about how it, it is related to the term survival of the fittest. So fitness means a measurement of the evolutionary success of an organism. So 
So a measure of reproductive success of an organism. Which means which organism can produce the greatest number of offsprings, offspring. So the number of offspring produced. So an organism, in terms of its evolutionary fitness, doesn't mean how strong it is, or doesn't mean how quick it is, or how fast it is. It means which organism can reproduce the most viable offspring. So let's come to this term that we often hear in the media called survival of the fittest. I think if you were to go out and ask 10 people what that meant, they would say the strongest survive or something on those lines. But in reality, that's not what it means at all. Your book mentions an example of moths to explain this. So if we have this background here, and let's make it kind of a blue background. And we have a red moth, a green moth, maybe a couple green moths, some black moths. And we have a blue moth. Well, the blue moth is going to be more concealed in this environment and won't be attacked by predators as easily. And so because of that, this moth will be able to reproduce more often and so therefore will be considered the most fit in this environment, in this population. It may turn out that this particular moth has better wings. So maybe black means better wings. So it can fly, fly stronger. The green one here, maybe it means it has better vision. The red one may be better hearing. But all that doesn't matter because all the other ones are being eaten because the predators can see it. This one may have poor hearing, poor vision, and poor wings, but it's surviving. It's technically weaker than all the others, but it, from an evolutionary standpoint, it is the fittest because it can reproduce more often because the predators don't see it. There's lots of examples like this, and we could go on and on. But I don't want this podcast to be a three-hour podcast. Now, we talked on the last podcast that there were four ways that allele frequency changes. We mentioned mutations. We mentioned gene flow. We mentioned genetic drift. And we mentioned natural selection. All of these affect allele concentrations in a population. Now, we mentioned on the last podcast, that natural selection can alter can alter the allele frequency in a population. Now, depending upon which phenotypes are preferred in a population, natural selection can do this in one of three ways. So there are going to be three ways to, to do this, and it's dependent upon what that, that particular, um, what, what particular traits are favored in that population. The first way is directional. The second way is disruptive. And the third and final way is stabilizing. In general, when we talk about these examples, we're going to talk about them in relation to a curve that might look something like this, where along the vertical axis we have 
frequency of individuals, frequency of frequency of individuals. And along the horizontal axis, we're going to have the different phenotypes. For instance, if we're talking, as, as your book talks about, mouse color, their coat color, you may have a white mouse here, a brown mouse here, and then a black mouse at the end. And some a light brown and a dark brown here. So let's first talk about our first one, directional evolution. And we're going to write that one right here, directional. And so let's draw our graph again. And we'll draw our original curve here. So this is the original population. And with directional, there is some selective pressure that favors one extreme. So for instance, if we had some sort of selective pressure pushed here, that's going to shift the curve this way. So if we were talking about coat color on mice, we would now have, still have our white mice here, our brown here, and our black, our black here. Whatever this pressure was, it did not favor the white mice, rather it favored the darker furred mice over here. It could have been change in the climate, it could have been moving to a hotter climate or a, warm, a cooler climate depending on which way it shifted here. It could have been a predator that could easily have spotted the white mice but not the black mice. Whatever it is, directional selection pushes it towards one extreme. It could have easily pushed the other way, I just did it on that, that way. Okay, so next let's talk about disruptive. All right, disruptive selection. Let's draw a graph here. And this time we're going to talk about a slightly different trait, but we're still going to have our original population like this. And we're going to talk about beak size in finches, let's say. So in the middle here, we're going to have a medium sized beak. On this side, we're going to, ha side, we're going to have small. And actually, I'm going to make this curve a little better here. And over here, we're going to have large beak size. Okay, so these are all beak size. And still over here are, is the frequency of individuals with these traits. So what disruptive does is present a condition, some selective pressure. So let's write selective pressure that favors the extremes. So the selective pressure is exerting itself here and we're going to end up with a graph that looks something like this where at, after the population has evolved we go from having more medium-sized beaks to having a population with more small and large in equal proportions here. And a good example, as, as is the reason we're using it here, are the beak sizes of various finches. For instance, in this one area, we know that they have undergone this sort of evolution because of the nuts and seeds that are available. So finches with a small beak beak are able to eat the soft and the small seeds. Whereas finches with a large beak can eat the larger, tougher 
nuts. So both of these are selected for. The medium size is selective against because the medium size apparently has a much more difficult time eating either one of these. So it's much better to be either small beaked or large beaked. Medium beaks uh, finches don't do so well. So this is disruptive. It disrupts right in the middle the kind of standard curve there. All right, let's look at our last one here of stabilizing. Again, we're going to have our graph as we did before. We're going to have our nice curve here. And your book brings up a really good example here, and so I'm going to use it. And it's the weight of babies. On average, healthy babies are around seven and a half pounds, give or take a pound and a half. So, you know, between six and and eight, eight and a half pounds is a typical size healthy baby. We know babies down here, say around two pounds, are less healthy. And we know babies up here at the upper limit, say around 14 pounds, are also less healthy. We know that two pound babies are going to have a much more difficult time um, living outside of the mother's environment. Um, the 14 pound baby, they're also going to have health problems. Um, there's a lot of diabetic issues related to a, a very heavy baby. And so over time what happens, we have some selective force, so right, selective force that acts against the extremes. So we have a force acting here and a force acting here at the two extremes. And so what we end up with is something that might look like this, where we, the way I've drawn this, it looks like we're totally eliminating the two extremes. We're not really totally eliminating them, but we're certainly reducing the extremes and the variation in between in favor of this optimal healthy weights of, of a baby. So this is called stabilizing because we stabilize this middle area. So regardless of the mode of selection, the basic mechanisms remain the same. That is, natural selection is going to select the traits that provide the greatest reproductive success. The underlying mechanism of dis directional disruptive or stabilizing is to have a, strong, a, a larger population of individuals that have a greater reproductive success. I'm going to write something down here. It's going to take me a few seconds, but it's something said a lot that is, I always find it a little difficult to wrap my hands around. So natural selection is the only mechanism that consistently leads to adaptive evolution. Remember, we said that there are four ways that we can generate allele frequencies, or change allele frequencies, I should say, in a population. We said that there is genetic drift, we said there is gene transfer, we said that there is mutation, and we said there is natural selection. All of these will generate changes in allele frequencies. But only natural selection can consistently lead to adaptive evolution. These three certainly change allele frequency. However, the frequencies that are left behind after genetic drift, gene transfer, or mutation could either be have a favorable phenotype or a non-favorable phenotype. You could imagine a mutation that is favorable. You could also imagine a mutation that's not favorable. You could imagine gene transfer when you have new alleles entering into the population because of, say, migration. 
you can imagine that having a good effect or a bad effect. Same thing with genetic drift. That could be a good effect or a bad effect. Natural selection, however, also, so up here, let's say change, changes allele frequency, I'm going to put plus or minus, because it can be good or bad for the organism and the reproductive success. Natural selection is the only one that changes allele frequencies. So change allele frequency and leads to increased reproductive success. A misconception that I think we should clear up here is that often adaptive traits are thought of something that's a new trait, a new, new allele in the population. So I'm going to write that here real quick and we're going to say adaptive traits are not new traits. These are traits that have always existed in that population. I'm going to erase something here. I don't want to say always existed. They are traits that previously in that population. I want to also state that these can, these first three can lead to adaptive evolution. It's just that it doesn't consistently do it. Natural selection always leads to increased reproductive success or adaptive evolution. Just if we were to draw our petri dish over here again with our different microbes in it, same species but different variants, You could imagine that, and again, let's say our blue one here has the antibiotic resistance gene in it. You could imagine that this green one might have a, gain a mutation that also gives it an antibiotic resistance, but it also might get a mutation that causes it to be more sensitive to antibiotic. We could have a situation where we have a genetic drift, where somehow or another, this whole half of the population is wiped out. And what we're left with is a green, a green, a red, a red, and a red. Neither of these have antibiotic resistance. So in this case, genetic drift is a negative towards adaptive evolution because we wiped out all of the alleles, all the bacteria with the alleles that led to antibiotic resistance. Only if you happen to have a bacterium here that has that antibiotic resistance in it can natural selection act upon that one individual to give it an increased reproductive success compared to its other bacteria in that, in that container? Okay, let's go ahead and erase this.